We're starting the Ezekiel's Temple study again. This will be the closing part of that. Last week, we looked at a number of videos and some pictures of uh, different conceptions of what is described by Ezekiel in that temple. And today, we're going to look back at some of those and pull some pieces out of what you saw. I hope you can remember some of that. I know it was a week ago. Um, and we're also going to look at some things, other things in Ezekiel that God says about that temple and why it's that way. And then at the end of this study, we're going to look at the big theological question, which is, why is there a temple in the millennial period when Jesus is ruling the earth? How does that make any sense? And we'll spend about four slides looking into that and, and understanding why there is a temple. And in fact, more than that, we'll understand a bit about what life will be like at that time. And it will be quite a bit different than what we know in our experience of life right now. So we'll begin by doing some review and pulling some things out, as I said, from what we had seen before. And if you remember, we had looked at Ezekiel's description of a temple that would be built, and we saw videos that, that helped us to understand that. And, and one thing that we know from what Ezekiel says is, is that it is a real temple. It's not a symbolic thing. It's not something uh, heavenly. It's, it's something that is a real physical thing. And part of the reason that we can understand that is because of that river that you saw. Remember the thin blue line out of there? And I described that that starts out as a very thin trickle coming out of the throne room, and then it uh, leads out to be a massive river. And Ezekiel goes on to describe what happens there. He says that that river goes down to what is now the Dead Sea and changes the Dead Sea from being extremely salty, even saltier than ocean water, uh, into something that is fresh water. And more than that, he says that um, that flow of water continues on now down into the, the Gulf of, is it the Gulf of Suez or Aqaba? I don't remember. But in any case, um, it, it, things are different at that time. Um, the, the old idea of how would a stream get from the temple to uh, the Dead Sea, there isn't a pathway for that now. And right now the Dead Sea is called a Dead Sea because water flows in and it never flows out. So it's only evaporation that makes the water go away. And the result of that is that salt. And that's why it is uh, salt, salty water flows in and becomes saltier and saltier all the time. And only evaporation takes the water away. And, and uh, so things are going to be much different at that time. And we talked about that last week, too. And, and so we also know that we're talking about something that's going to be in the millennium. And we know that because Jesus is ruling the earth at that time. And this is the temple that, that isn't going to be built um, in this phase. It's going to be coming up in, in the next phase of uh, what God's plan is. And we saw in Ezekiel, and especially in those videos, we saw that there is sufficient detail in there to build it. Um, all the measurements are in there. They're in a, a units that we aren't familiar with. They're in cubits and uh, reeds, and we don't use those, of course. And Chance brought up a good question in one of the pictures that he saw. He said, uh, why is this measurement different here than it is on the other slide? And I didn't have an answer for that, but I did look into it. And the reason is that um, one of the authors used the small cubit, uh, the short cubit, as it's called, and the other one used the long cubit. And, and so using the short cubit was a mistake because all of Ezekiel's measurements are done in long cubits. And that's a strange idea to us. We don't have anything like a short foot and a long foot um, when we're doing measurements. Uh, we don't. We like to have nice exact standards. Things weren't always that way. So. But we did see that there was sufficient detail to build that whole structure. We, we know all the dimensions, the measurements. In fact, even some of the adornments on the walls are described. So, and, and when, as we saw it, we, we saw some things that were similar to what we remember from Solomon's temple. Um, it had um, some of the same things, like the sacrificial altar. And it was broken, or, organized in the same way. There was an outer court and an inner court and then a holy of holies. And, and so some things like that were very similar, but a lot of things were very different. And, and so part of what we'll look at today is why are those differences there? And, and I think you'll find some interesting things there. And one thing we also saw was it's very large. And I want to dig into that in some depth right away here. It's the, the area of that uh, um, temple area is about four times the size of the current temple mount, which is a large structure. Um, it's um, bigger than a football field. We saw that in, in scale. And um, what this slide shows is this is um, what we call now the city of David back in David's time. Okay, so the city of David is built kind of on, a, on this side of a hill. Uh, 
uh, going up there. Um, the palaces would have been up at the top. Uh, up in here uh, was where David's palaces and stuff would have been, and the people lived down here. And it was all uh, surrounded by uh, gated walls, because that's how they did things back then. But up at the top, that is where the Temple Mount would eventually be built. Uh, you may not remember it, but it was David who originally purchased that land, and uh, um, it became ultimately the land that was used to build the, the temple. And it contains that part of the world that God calls his holy mountain or his holy hill. And, and so just kind of a little to the left of, and up at the top of the hill is where the Temple Mount would be uh, eventually, many thousands of years later. And um, so this kind of gives you an idea of the terrain. Um, this um, Mount Moriah is another name for it, um, is not a mountain like you might think of uh, a mountain that you can stand on a, on a peak so much. There is a peak. It's, it's uh, a kind of a little bump that's on top of that plain that you can see, kind of the top surface of ground there once you get up the hill is fairly flattish. And in fact, when King David bought it, that was farmland and, and people would farm there. And, and uh, so despite that one little hill there, um, which is where the Temple Mount would be built on, um, it's flattish and, and farmland, or was. And, and so I want you to kind of understand the, uh, the way of the curves of the surfaces that are going on here. And um, more than that, I want you to look at this one here. Now, this is modern times. And in that circle, you can see that is the same area that you saw in the last picture. That's uh, the, what's now called the City of David. But historically, it was called Salem. And if you remember, uh, Melchizedek was the king of Salem. So it, it seems like that's the place that he was the king of. And later on, it was taken over by a man called Jebus. And if you remember the Jebusites, they are the people who came from Jebus. And then later on, King David took it over and renamed it to be Jerusalem. And, and now it's specifically called the City of David, but it's inside of Jerusalem. Uh, and so it's become a, a town within a, a city. So um, what I really want you to see there, though, is uh, this is the Temple Mount up here. If you see that golden dome just above the black line and, and black circle, um, that golden dome is the Dome of the Rock Mosque. And down below it, you can see the, the wall. There's a, a wall that's partly overwritten by the black line. And that is kind of the width of the Temple Mount right now. And, and so it's a sizable structure. Um, and this structure that we're talking about, this new temple that Ezekiel describes, is going to be twice that width um, on that side. And um, what you also probably don't realize is that the ground, well, you can sort of see it there. The ground is, is sloping up. And so on this side of that temple mount, there is this huge wall. And that would be 30 feet tall, maybe more. Um, and um, but on the other side of it, it is flat to the ground. So you can walk in directly from the other side, from the northern side. We're looking at it from the south here, looking at the southern side. And, and so from uh, the north, you can just walk in from flat ground. But on this side, you actually have to go upstairs. And, and it was an, an amazing, beautiful temple. Um, it had archways and all sorts of things. And it had a stairway, a couple stairways that would take you up if you came up this side of it. Um, and so... The part of the problem here is that you can see how the ground slopes. And if you make that thing, give it four times the area that it currently has, you have a problem with the slope of the land. And, and it would be kind of hard to build it um, because it is such a slope down in the city of David. And, and we talked about that coming uh, earthquake that is going to split the Mount of Olives, which would be off to the right here. You can't see it. And, and, um, and so we expect a lot of reshaping of the ground. There's things that we know of. We know that the Dead Sea now is going to empty out into the Gulf. Uh, we know that this land is going to be much flatter than it was and higher. There are verses that talk about this becoming higher. And you can see that right now, God's holy hill is lower than a whole bunch of other hills around it. Uh, but there are verses that talk about it being higher than all the other hills. So there's going to be some definite reshaping of the land that's going to be happening in the future. But this kind of gives you some context of where it is now, what it looks like now, and how it has to fit in in the future. So things that we also saw back in the videos last week is the, the door into the Holy of Holies. I, I mentioned that that veil isn't there anymore. And in Solomon's time, there's a very heavy veil. You might not realize how heavy it was. It wasn't just a thin curtain. It was 
uh, most people think about a few inches thick from the description that, that's in there. And so it was a whole bunch of heavy cloth um, that was quite thick. And it was, it was never opened. It was never left open. It wasn't the kind of curtain where you would tie it back and let some sunshine in, uh, let the, the dust out, anything like that. It always stayed that way. And so when you went to go in there, and it, you only went in, remember once, only the chief priest went in on this one day. And, and so he would have to kind of push past this heavy curtain. And as soon as he did push past it and got through, the curtain would automatically close behind him because of the weight of the curtain and, and the thickness of the material. So um, that's how it was at that time, um, that it, it was a kind of a curtain that was always closed and stayed closed. And, and even when the priest went through it, it closed right away behind him. And then we remember when Jesus died, that curtain, that heavy curtain, um, was ripped from top to bottom. And that signified uh, both Jesus' death and, and the end of that covenant and, and uh, the temple being a different thing than it ever was going to be or had been at that time. And now here we see in Ezekiel's temple, we see that there's a folding double door. Now that's completely different from a curtain. It's not something that closes by itself. It's um, not heavy. It's easily opened. And, and it's something you can leave open. So it, it seems that to indicate that there's going to be a difference in this temple. There's going to be frequent coming and going into the Holy of Holies. And that wasn't the case before. And, and perhaps it maybe even indicates there's something like office hours going on, that you would open the doors for the day and then close them at, at nighttime, something like that, maybe. I'm, I'm putting my own thoughts in there. Ezekiel doesn't talk about exactly how those doors are going to work. But we do see that there's a folding double door, and that's a completely different idea from the heavy veil that used to be there before, the heavy curtain that used to be there. Another thing you probably noticed is the eyes on the wheels. And I think I mentioned that when that video played, the, the wheels on God's vehicle. And I, I'm going to show that picture again in a little bit here. Um, and, and so eyes appear in other prophetic visions, and, and, and they are there to indicate something. Um, and they are they appear on symbolically described things. So so if something is a symbol of something, uh, it represents something. Then and it has eyes on it. Well, that has meaning to it. And and what the eyes on uh, something prophetic mean is that they symbolize something has greater insight. It, it can see and understand things that others don't. And that's only ever applied to people. Um, and so it, it's really talking about people you might call a seer, someone who has a, a depth of sight that other people don't have. He sees things um, due to God's revelation, of course. And, and so um, that's what that means. And so this wheel is probably not so much a separate thing, but it's really more of a description of the angel that it's attached to. Remember, each of the angels had a wheel beside them. And so I think the wheel is really telling us more about the angel, and, and that the angel has this insight that, that you wouldn't expect a normal person to have, or even a normal angel, angel perhaps. And, and so um, it's probably telling us more about the angel than anything else. And remember, an angel is a spiritual being, as God is spiritual. He doesn't have a body like we have. And so any representation of him is going to be um, a physical representation that isn't really part of his nature. Um, remember in, in the Bible, or maybe you don't remember, um, angels appear in a couple different forms. Um, they have kind of what some people call a glorified form, which is when they're all glowy and bright, and sometimes they have iron legs and all sorts of things like that that are, are showing us something about their character. And, um, but in, in other times, they appear as ordinary men, and you don't know that they are anything other than ordinary men. You, you can't tell that. And so angel, physicality to an angel isn't the same for us. We have this one body, and this is what we live in. Angels aren't constrained that way. And, and so these descriptions that we're seeing of this vehicle are really more symbolic descriptions of the angels and, and what the angels can do or what they are. And so um, it, this, this, these wheels within wheels and the wings on the angels are probably telling us more about what the angel is capable of doing and not so much what he really looks like. And, and so these angels are on God's ride. They are the motivation. They, they move it forward, backward, to the side. And, and so um, perhaps these eyes that we see are, are giving them knowledge about what God's intent is, where they're going, the destination, how to get to that destination. Uh, there's some guesswork there. Ezekiel doesn't talk about that either. But, it, but it's interesting to understand that, that eyes have that prophetic meaning. Another thing we, we saw mentioned in that temple was angels. Um, they were part of the decorations. Uh, the temple was decorated, it says, with angels and palm trees. 
And, and so right away, you need to think, why? How does that make sense? What, what relationship does an angel have to a palm tree? Or is, is there something in common? What, what is, how does that make sense? And unfortunately, we, we don't know. But I'll just read the verses that talk about that. It says, but each of the angels had four faces and four wings. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being. And on the right side, each had the face of a lion. And on the left, the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. On the temple were carved cherubim and palm trees. Palm trees alternated with cherubim. Each cherub had two faces, the face of a human being toward the, the palm tree on one side and the face of a lion toward the palm tree on the other. They were carved all around the whole temple. Okay, so the first set of verses there come from when Ezekiel first sees God riding in on this vehicle. And, and he's describing what he sees for angels. And then in the second set, it's talking about how the temple is to be adorned with these, these faces. And, and if you were looking really closely at the video, you would see that the angel shape there has a very weird, the head has something on one side that's different from what's on the other side. And, and being kind of a shadow, you can't uh, make out a lion or, or you can't make out that it's um, anything else, a human face. So um, if, if someone were to tell you, uh, draw a picture of an angel for me, I think most people would, would draw a picture of a human being uh, with two wings. But the Bible never describes angels that way. Angels generally have four wings or six wings, and they generally have multiple faces, and they often have legs that are not human legs. Uh, in fact, the ones described um, by Ezekiel are the, lo the legs of an ox, I think it is. And so um, these descriptions are, are telling us, I think, more about the angel than, than anything else. And um, angels don't look like what we think of. Yeah, most people have the wrong conception of that. Um, I'm not even sure where that idea of, of a two-winged um, human-bodied angel comes from. Okay, so this is the picture we saw last week of, of God sitting on his ride, sitting on his throne, which is on the top of this transparent layer. You see the angels um, described as having four wings and those faces that we talked about. And you can see down there, if you look, um, those, it's hard to see. Those are animal hoofs uh, that they have for feet hanging down. And uh, there's the wheels with the eyes on them that I was talking about before. So... I want you to keep this in mind. Um, I, I think of all of these things that we've talked about. We've talked about this throne. We've talked about this transparent layer, the four angels underneath that transparent layer, and these wheels. And I'm going to have you compare that against another picture. And I have a reason for, for doing that. So, so consider what you're seeing here carefully. And then we'll skip to a little bit of text. And, and the idea I want you to see here is that we, we've seen... And, and the Bible says specifically that the earthly temple and the priests are in some way a copy of the heavenly temple. We, that, that appears in many places, and, and we've seen that recently in a study. And, and so this appears to be true for God's earthly ride and his heavenly ride, is that the earthly ride is in some way a copy of the heavenly temple. So let me show you this picture now. If you think about it, all of the same elements are here. Um, where, you, where you saw four angels before, you now see four priests where you saw those wheels that, that seemed to be how the thing moved, these four priests also have two feet um, rather than uh, two wheels uh, locked together. The, the priests are separated from, the, um, from God, and they're kept away by those poles. And if you remember the restriction on that, they weren't allowed to touch that um, Ark of the Covenant at all. That would be death to them. And, and so they didn't. This picture, I think, misconstrues it. I think the poles would have been longer because you wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere close to the Ark of the Covenant uh, because of that restriction. So I think the, the poles were longer and, and there was greater distance, but this is an artist's conception of it. No one has ever seen it that's living still. And then up above the Ark of the Covenant, at the top of that, there are two angels up there that, that are top of the that are part of the top cover. And, and God's presence would appear between the wings of those two angels up there. So if you look at that, you can see all of those um, same things that are common to them. Um, the, the glory of the Lord on the earthly one would appear between the wings of the two cherubim. And in the heavenly one, God is on his throne under a rainbow of color. And Isaiah actually talks about this. He says, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. So, so he has understood that that um, Ark of the Covenant is God's throne on earth, and that God, um, who appeared between the wings of the cherubim, was enthroned there. So you, you can see that he gets that idea. 
And, and so the earthly uh, ride has gold covered poles and the priests were not allowed to touch the ark. The heavenly ride has a transparent layer that separates God from the angels and the wheels. So there's a commonality there as well. And as I mentioned before, the four priests, with each with two legs, are mirrored by uh, four angels, each with a wheel within a wheel. So that when you hear that the heavenly temple is the similar uh, or similar to the earthly temple, think in those kind of terms: is that somehow there was kind of a translation from um, the heavenly which we couldn't really understand fully down to the earthly and, and in an image of that in some way. Okay, now there's a number of special ideas that come from the text of Ezekiel. We didn't cover this last week. Um, um, Ezekiel 43, seven says, the people of Israel, now this is God speaking, the people of Israel will never again defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings by their prostitution and the funeral offerings for their kings at their death. Now, we understand prostitution um, isn't talking about physical prostitution. It's talking about um, prostituting themselves spiritually. So they were turning away to other gods and prostituting themselves. And he says, and he also mentioned that one of the offenses that God found uh, particularly offensive from their prostitution was the funeral offerings for kings when kings died. And, and that might not be something we've ever thought of as something that would offend God, but how we revere people, worldly people who have died or reveal them even in, even in life um, can be an offense to God. And, and, it, and he says, um, you did this before and you're not ever going to do this again. And, and um, so we need to be careful that we don't get caught up in doing what the world does. Um, it, it's easy to think, well, the Bible doesn't say do this or don't do this, but we need to think for ourselves sometimes. And, and here's a, a case where if you read carefully enough, you can see that this is an offense to God. Um, Funeral offerings for kings when they die is, is a problem. And, and so um, that's what God is speaking about here in this thing. And then he continues on into another, uh, same, basically the same idea of more things that they had done to offend God. And he says, when they placed their threshold uh, next to my threshold, so he's talking about a building, the threshold of a building next to my threshold. So he's talking about um, the threshold of their building being next to the threshold of the temple. And, and their doorposts beside my doorposts, with only a wall between me and them, they defiled my holy name by their detestable practices. So I destroyed them in my anger. So what, he, what he's saying is with the old temple, and, and we saw with that, uh, the Temple Mount, and, and uh, we, we didn't see the earlier temples because we don't know what they look like. Um, but nonetheless, um, people would build their buildings very close to that. And that's kind of a human nature thing. Um, I want to be near to God. Uh, this kind of makes sense to humans to, to think that way. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted distance. He wanted separation. He wanted to be treated as something special. And so uh, that's why Ezekiel's temple describes that huge, huge open area that's around the temple. If you remember, there was the temple complex, and it's just a dot within this uh, huge area, this huge keep out area that God has set is, is uh, for no one to be doing any building, anything than that. It's to be a reserved holy area, and nobody is ever again going to be building their buildings right next to the temple. Nonetheless, that happened in history, and, and human nature, again, tells us that you would want to be near God, but that's not what God wants, and so it's easy, again, to slip into misunderstanding God by applying human values and human standards. Another idea that comes out of Ezekiel comes from uh, chapter 43, verses 10 through 11. And it says, Son of man, describe the temple to the people of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their sins. Let them consider its perfection. And if they are ashamed of all they have done, make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangement, its exits and entrances, its whole design, and all its regulations and laws. Now, this is probably the most interesting thing in all of Ezekiel. It's making a statement that um, the temple has a message inside of it. And there are many people who believe that of the old temple, because the same kind of level of measurements that we see for Ezekiel are also given in, I think it's Deuteronomy. And, and it describes exactly the dimensions of the, um, the tent and um, all of the things that went on there and who did what. And, um, and people have for a long time believed that there's a message in there, but I've never found anyone who could really say what that message was. But here what we see in this is clearly God saying, this temple has a message for it for the people of Israel. And, and if they consider the um, architecture of it, the, the perfection of the architecture, uh, 
and it will make them ashamed of all of the things that they have done. And that's a very interesting idea that, that if you dig into these details of the temple and, and can make sense of it, um, that there's a message in there for you that will tell you about that. And, and the one that we know right away, because we just saw what God said about that, is, is he describes this huge open area that is to be around the temple so no one will build there. And so he, he's saying that if you look at all of the things that are, are done structurally here, you can understand some of the evil things that you've done and, and what you shouldn't be doing anymore. So interesting idea there that the architecture of things can have a meaning in it. Okay, so now we'll get down to the theological question here. And, and that is, why is there a temple and sacrifices going on while Jesus it has, after Jesus has come and Jesus is living on the earth, living in this temple? Uh, and so um, Hebrews, we didn't go this far in Hebrews when we were doing our Hebrew study, but Hebrews says that animal sacrifices accomplished nothing. Um, they were done there because God said that they should be done. He said, um, if you have done this sin, I want you to do this. And, and that's why it was done. But they didn't uh, make anything different. They, they couldn't um, make you perfect. They couldn't uh, make anything better. They were done just because God said, I want them to be done. So here in this millennial period, um, we, we would wonder, well, what's going on? Um, and in our time, our current time, we ask uh, the question, why don't we sacrifice animals now? And that's because it's just not part of this covenant. Um, that was part of what went away when, when Jesus' sacrifice covered everything. And, and so all of those sacrifices were actually symbolic descriptions of Jesus' sacrifice. And, and that would be the sacrifice that replaced all of those things. And so that just asks, asks the question even more of why would these temple and sacrifices be coming back in the millennium? And so we need to understand a little bit about how exactly um, atonement happens and salvation happens. And, and so we'll do just a little bit on that. Um, Jesus' sacrifice is, was an atonement, which means it was a covering for sin. It, it covered over sin. And, and it, but it's only available to those who believe and trust in him. Now, it doesn't mean believe he exists, but it means that they have a much deeper belief in him. It means trusting him uh, in, in a way that um, we trust very few people. Um, and, and so this is a key part of it, that the sacrifice, uh, the atonement is applied only to those who have this level of faith. And, and we saw in the Hebrew study um, that intentional sin is rejecting that. You've, you've uh, stopped trusting in God if you've intentionally sinned. And, and that is described in Hebrews as rejecting him and trampling him. And, and so you can have that trust and you can lose that trust. And, and, um, and we've seen that, we talked about that last week, that there are some people in our lives that we know who've made that transition out of Christianity. We, we are stunned by that. So, yes. question here. Um, so listening to what just said, what you just said in the previous um, slide, um, intentional sin, right? Right. And if we look back into the design of the temple um, or the structures near, you know, uh, where God resides, you know, it just reminds me of intentional sin and the, the temple and, and building you know, around, you know, where, where God, you know, his, his presence should be. It reminds me of um, these amazing, you know, these cathedrals and churches. They're so ornate, you know, a lot of them with actual jewels and diamonds and gold and yeah. the whole thing. And it just goes on. The opulence just goes on and on and on. And it's supposed to be a place of worship first. Adonai, yep. but it's really a place of worship to themselves. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, you and are. And it's intentional. It's intentional. It's intentional. They built it in a certain way. This opulence with gold <clears throat> and silver and diamonds and rubies. It's intentional. It is. Yeah, and that is such a good point. Um, it, those are, buildings were built to glorify man, not to glorify God. And, and that's a real problem. Um, and And... Yeah, you, you know, the Catholic churches are probably what you're referring to there because they're much more ornate than, than most Protestant churches. But yeah, uh, that's part of the message here is, is God's design, when you look at it, is, is simple and elegant all at the same time. And, and so no man is glorified that, by that. Um, it, it is only God who's glorified by that. 
And in fact, in the construction of the temple, when it was first being built by uh, Solomon, God said, I don't want this to be built by, uh, by people chopping away at stones on the temple mount. I, I want them to do all of the stone preparation offsite and then just bring the stones in and plop them in so that people won't see um, people as the builders of the temple. They, they won't see the builders at all and, and the builders won't be glorified for what they've done in, in building God's temple. So, yeah, good point. Um, we, that's another place where we slip very often is um, thinking that we're glorifying God by doing fancy buildings when he clear, clearly said that's not what he wanted. Okay, so um, continuing on with the idea that faith is essential to salvation and, and faith is what makes atonement available to us. So, so Jesus' death um, created an atonement that would cover sin, but it's only available to those who believe trust have faith in him and and um so it's it's definitely exclusionary it's only available to those people and and so we enter into this new covenant that jesus set up by a step of faith and and faith in jesus who is unseen and and that's kind of a key part of this is that um what is faith and and faith is uh believing in something that is unseen and actually hebrews chapter 11 goes into that um and it talks about um, faith is not faith if it's seen, and and um, and that makes sense. Um, you can't believe in in someone like that if you, you if you know them. There's nothing to believe because you you know them. They're standing right in front of you, and and so that's the situation in the millennium, is that Jesus is is there, and that was different even when Jesus was there the first time because he came as a man and didn't and not as a god and didn't look like anything special. Um, was was just a man as far as anybody could tell. So faith was still necessary to believe who he was. And, and so faith was required even at that time. And, and I'll, I'll quote from Matthew 16, verses 15 through 17 about that. This is Jesus uh, speaking. Uh, he's speaking to his disciples. He says, but he said to them, who is it that you say that I am? Simon, Kepha, uh, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeshua answered and said to him, you are blessed, Simon Bar-Jonah, because Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So right there you see the idea that, the, that faith was required for them to, uh, to believe in Jesus, to understand who he was. And, and Simon Peter had gotten to that stage where God revealed that to him. And, and uh, so kind of something probably clicked in his head and, and he said, oh, I know who this is. I get this. I, this, is, this is the guy who was promised. And not only is he the Messiah, he is the son of the living God. And, and so... Uh, that faith was still required at that time, even though Jesus was there, because he didn't look like God. He just looked like an ordinary man. Um, but it'll be different in the millennium. Um, Jesus will be there, but he will be the bright, shiny God character that, that is more typical of him. And, and uh, he'll be right there. Uh, he'll be in Jerusalem. Um, Ezekiel talks about that. We saw his ride coming in last week. And, and so he'll be resident in the temple um, right there. And, and so there simply won't be any doubting that there is a God or trusting in him because he's just right there. And so during the millennium, that kind of faith, the kind of faith that brings salvation and atonement won't be possible because the reality is there. Now, that might be a difficult concept to, to kind of put your head around, but I'm, I'm going to back this up with a verse in just a moment. So if faith was possible during that time, if you think about that, um, and, and people could believe at that time, then they would all automatically become Christians because what's to doubt uh, when he's standing right in front of you? And, and they would be given new bodies as we had been given new bodies earlier. And, and so that kind of would present a problem if faith was possible at that time. But instead, what we know is going to happen is um, Satan's going to be chained up and, and then the world is going to be perfect for a while. And then Satan is going to be released and he's going to turn all of those people against God again. And, and they're going to try to war against God. So we know that they aren't becoming uh, Christians and they're not being given new bodies. So that's definitely not happening. And, and, and that is, if you can understand it, that the kind of faith that brings salvation isn't possible in the millennium because the reality of God is right there and, and undeniable. So, um, so the point is that it, in the millennium, it's no longer possible to enter into the current covenant. That covenant came to an end. And here's uh, something from Matthew 25. You, you've all read this, these verses about the, um, the virgins and the oil, and some had uh, prepared and some hadn't prepared. And, and I'm not going to read that whole story because that's not the point here. I, I want to pick out a couple of verses you might not have noticed. So 
uh, the foolish virgin said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Behold, our lamps have gone out. But, okay, now what does oil mean here? Oil is talking about spiritualness. It's talking about um, the Holy Spirit. And, and our lamps have gone out means that we have wandered away from the Holy Spirit. We've gone off and done our own thing, so we no longer have oil. So, but the wise answered and said, why, there is not enough for us and for you. Go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And when they went to buy, so how would you be buying oil? You would be going out to, to churches to try and find um, the, the faith that you needed to, to achieve this. And, and unfortunately, we know that the churches of that time um, would are horrible churches. Um, they're not teaching any kind of gospel. And, and you can't get oil from them. So, uh, and, and when they went to buy, so they went out to get some faith and, and some knowledge and some instruction, um, the groom came. And those who were ready entered with him into the wedding place and the door was barred okay means nobody else gets in but afterward those other virgins came and they were saying now they came back doesn't say they have any oil because they couldn't have found any because there wasn't any available um our lord our lord open to us but he answered and said to them amen i say to you that i do not know you and so we see right there the idea that that when the messiah comes um, the door is barred. It's not possible for anyone else to enter into that covenant after that point. And, and so that's, um, it doesn't say why that is in, in this parable, um, but I, I kind of explained it with the, the faith and what faith is. Um, but we know that for sure that that barring is going to happen and, and it won't be possible to enter that. So, so after Jesus comes and, and comes down to earth, um, those of us who have been transformed into our new bodies are going to be with him. But there won't be any more people who will ever be transformed into bodies under that covenant for sure because that covenant is, is closed off by the fact that jesus is there okay so that leaves us with the situation that, that i talked about a little bit before but i'm going to do it again um, what's going to be the case is there's going to be two kinds of beings three if you count god uh, living on the earth at that time there's going to be believers now in their glorified bodies and so we'll be bright shiny says the bible um and there's going to be non-believers and and um and those are the people who are non-believers when jesus came and among those non-believers there's going to be a mix of jews and gentiles and and um and we'll see that in the temple is that the temple is being manned by jews as it always was but it's also a place for gentiles so also in this millennial period, it will also not be possible to be a sinner. Um, in many places, the Bible talks about immediate correction, and it uses the words ruled with an iron rod and ideas like that. And, and that means that, um, that sin will be corrected immediately. Uh, in fact, there will be an attempt to keep people from sinning, but if they insist on sinning, uh, correction will be applied immediately. And so it's a different world uh, than we live in now by far. Uh, and, and so... What we can see here with this temple and the sacrifices is that for those people who are not um, in their new bodies, their glorified bodies, um, it, they're going to be in this system that is similar to the Old Testament system. They're going to be in a system where there are still sacrifices to be made. There are going to be a, a temple. God's going to be at the temple. Um, and God was at the temple in the Old Covenant, too, for most of the time until it got so bad that he had to leave. But... Um, it, yes, he's going to be in the temple again in a more physical way. And, um, his presence was there before, but now kind of the reality of him will be there in the temple. And, and so um, it seems like this whole system of temple and sacrifices is set up for those people who were unbelievers at the time that Jesus came. And, and that will be, I presume, some kind of an atonement for him. There's, there's no real detail about how that is going to work in, in the future. A lot, a lot of authors have looked at that idea and tried to figure it out. So different world and, and a world now that has two different kinds of people and one of those kinds of people, God still wants there to be a temple and sacrifices for that group of people. Um, and I mentioned that the Jews are still God's people and, the, and they will be um, the priests who will be serving in the temple. Um, and, and so the priestly line are still going to be serving in the temple. But there's some exceptions about that. Ezekiel talks about certain families of priests who did very bad things are going to be no longer priests. Instead of being priests or even guards in the inner court, they're going to be guards in the outer court. And so there's a demotion that's going on here. 
uh, in, in some of these things. Um, and, it, and Ezekiel goes into explaining what, they, what their family line did a long time ago. And, um, but I think the main thing to, to understand for us here is that this temple and the sacrificial system is not for us. Um, it, it is something for the other people, now us assuming that we are in glorified bodies at that time. Um, so we, we won't have any part in the operation of that. We won't have a role in that. It, it will serve no purpose for us. Um, it's there for them and not for us. Um, I believe that we will have a role um, uh, in, the, in the world, and that will be teaching and enforcement, those kinds of things that will need to be done. And perhaps the enforcement will, will require making trips to the temple to bring people to the temple. I can only kind of guess at that. Um, but this is a different world that we're in, and, and you can see it. It's quite plain that this temple makes it a different world than we've seen before. Okay, so in closing um, all of this, um, and also in closing Ezekiel, uh, this section of Ezekiel, the last chapter, um, we, we saw that there were doors instead of a curtain in the Holy of Holies, and that was kind of an interesting idea. And, and Ezekiel also ends in, in a very interesting way. Uh, the last verse says, and the name of the city, that's the city where the temple is, from that time on will be, the Lord is there. And so that is actually a Hebrew word, of course, um, from Ezekiel. And uh, it doesn't say Lord. I've mentioned before that when the Bible says Lord, that's actually um, something some people did a long time ago, not too long after Jesus, um, where they uh, took out all references to Yahweh and replaced them with the word Lord. So if you look in the Hebrew, um, that's saying Yahweh Shmi, and, and that means Yahweh, their word. Now, they've translated that into a word that isn't an English word. Uh, we don't have a word called their word. But what it means is uh, Yahweh is there and will continue to be there, for, like there and forward, if you can think of it that way. So that says uh, quite clearly that this temple is built there. God will be there at that temple in that city, and that's going to continue on. Not indefinitely, we know that that comes to an end at the end of the millennium, but for the period of the millennium, um, that's the way things are going to be. Dan, can you, can you say that name again? Oh, okay. Oh, um, Yehweh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And the, the other one, is that the thing? That's Shmi. Um, and, and that's the word that translates to their word, their, and, and continuing on. So uh, on that pronunciation of that, no one knows the exact way to pronounce that. Um, you can see um, vowel points underneath the Hebrew letters there. Um, that is, those aren't original. Um, the original Hebrew didn't have those vowel points that indicated how things should be pronounced. And, and the correct pronunciation was lost. And so no one exactly knows um, what the vowels were that fit in there. And so this is this translator, he believes that that A sound should be in there. And then that makes some sense too, because um, in most other words, um, the het has that sound. Um, but it's still a, a guess about what vowel goes in there. So we can never say for sure how Yahweh is pronounced. Uh, not now, I assume that eventually we will. Uh, Stan, isn't there um, specific names that one uses for God, depending upon the situation depending upon what they're calling him for. Yes. Uh, and there are numerous names. In Absolutely. Um, and, and this is the name that is called his personal name. So in the same way that my personal name is Stan or yours is Joe, um, that this is believed to be his personal name. All the other names are titles. And so El Shaddai, things like that are, are um, El Shaddai means the mighty one. Um, and, and other words like that are, are descriptions that are used of him. They're like titles. Um, so you are Pastor Joe. So in, in that same sense, it seems to be um, that God is often referred to, and sometimes in adjacent verses, in different ways, using those different titles. And there's meaning in that. Um, the, the title that's used tells you something about what's being said in the, in the words that are using that. But yeah, there are a lot of titles for that. I saw a long list one time. In fact, I have a book on that somewhere here. It might be a good study as well. Yeah, I know I have a, a book on uh, the titles of God, and that would be a good study. Any other questions or anything?